ask him not to tell him that I ask him. <laughs> you only ask once. Ron says, is there anything you'd like me to say? I said, what do you to say? <clears throat> anyway, I just finished a panel that was heavy. I just finished a panel, being a part of a panel that was one of the heaviest panels I've ever been on, jazz critics and musicians. Wow. And I wasn't even supposed to be there. I thought I was supposed to be at another panel and they brought me to this panel and anyway it was an experience because we talked about jazz criticism. Could you turn down the treble on that? <laughs> Don't you know treble is trouble? <laughs> More bass. <laughs> it's, um, it's been a problem for ever since there was people writing about the music. Um, understanding why there's critics and it's, it was very, very, uh, it was a learning experience for me because uh, I was telling them when I opened at the five spot in 1959 with Ornette and Don Cherry and Billy Higgins, I was about 21 years old. And, and um, the critics trashed us. I mean, I had never been called so many names in my life. And we were just trying to play and uh, we wanted to play the music as beautifully as we could play it. And that's really what we were all, all thinking about, is playing and presenting the music in a beautiful way so people would really like it. And then the jazz critics at the New York Times and I guess every major paper in New York and all the jazz magazines really put us down. And there were some, there were a few exceptions, very few of people who really understood what we were trying to do. We didn't really think about being innovators. We didn't really think about what that meant. Matter of fact, I didn't really think about that until I read it in a review. And uh, we, were, we were trying to be spontaneous with our music and tr we were trying to play music as honestly as we could play and to play something as beautifully as we could play. With beautiful melodies, beautiful harmonies, beautiful intervals. We wanted to play a chord structure that was spontaneously created instead of improvising on a set chord structure of a song, creating a new chord structure for that composition as we were playing and um, the critics came around eventually. Thanks a lot. But I, I told them that now I think there's too much bass. <laughs> No, there's never. Um, I told him that I wouldn't want to be a critic because if I came to a performance of a band that I really loved and they were having a bad night, I wouldn't want to say anything bad. So that's a real uh, dilemma right there. And but there were, you know, there were some harsh words going back and forth on that stage, man, with the musicians and the critics. But I think we all came to an understanding that we're all working toward the same cause, which is elevating the music and, and expanding the music to a wider audience to, to expose more people to the, this art form, people that don't ordinarily get to hear it. That's why a couple of years ago, something really great happened. Uh, we did a tour of the states on something called the Verve Jazz Fest. I think it was the first time that anything like that had been done since jazz at the Philharmonic, where 
Mike Quartet West and the band that made the movie Kansas City, the Kansas City band, and uh, and Joe Henderson's trio did a tour of 19 cities in the United States in major theaters, and we sold out almost every one. It was such a great feeling to, to participate in that and know that you were bringing music to places where people would not ordinarily hear this music in a concert. And, uh, so that's what we're trying to do. I'm really glad that everybody's here. Wow. This is a great turnout. The heating? Well, I'm glad it's not the air conditioning. Um, In 1982, I played a, a duet concert at Cal Arts with a trumpet player named Bobby Bradford, who you probably all know his music, beautiful musician. And after the concert, we were packing up our instruments and people started asking questions. So we started answering, and it ended up another hour of talking like a dialogue between us and the, and the audience, which was really great. And, and uh, someone gave me a note from the Dean of Music, Nicholas England at that time, asking me if I would come by his office. And I said, oh God, what have I done now? You know? <laughs> and uh, so I went and met him and he said, I really liked what you had to say about creative music and improvisation and I would really like it if you would come here and do that. And I said, you mean come here and talk about creativity and music and improvisation? And he said, yes. He said, that's what Cal Arts is all about, is, is creating new art forms and adding to the vocabulary of all the art forms. He said, we have every art form represented here. We have dance, we have design, we have painting, we have theater, we have film. We have uh, classical music, we have, and now we want to get jazz, and I, I want you to do it. And so I said, well, there are some con conditions. I said that I'll be able to really uh, conduct the studies in a way where um, I'll have uh, complete control over how that's done, first of all, I don't want any big bands here. <laughs> I think Cal Arts is one of the only jazz studies in the country that does not have a big band. Not that I don't like big bands. Um, one of my early music experiences when I was a kid, singing country music on the radio with my family, was listening to the radio and hearing Duke Ellington and Fletcher Henderson and Dizzy Gillespie's big band, and Count Basie, and Stan Kenton. I love big bands, but what I wanted to stress there was individuality, discovering one's voice on an instrument, discovering one's sound, discovering one's music, one's soul, talking about the process of uh, improvising. What happens when you improvise? Where does it come from? What is a solo? Why do we call it a solo? Do you really want to take a solo? Why are you taking a solo? Maybe you don't want to take a solo. Maybe there's no such thing as a solo. Maybe there's only music. And discovering your music like each of us have different fingerprints, we each hear music differently. We each hear harmony differently, we each hear melody differently, and intervals, and chords. And so, when I said this, Nicholas England said, that's what I want. So I started the jazz studies at Cal Arts in 1982, and now it's developed into one of the best, I think, in the world, and with a lot of great people teaching, and, and uh, students from all over the world. I only have time now to, to devote. Uh, every Tuesday afternoon I have a class 
called uh, spirituality and music and improvisation. And then I have private students, but uh, they have now expanded the curriculum. They have arranging and composing and jazz history. They have um, a lot of different jazz ensembles. Uh, great teachers from all over, guest artists from all over every Monday. And um, it's developed just the way I wanted it to and just the way I envisioned and it's not finished. It's, we've got a long way to go and, and a lot of great things more to experience musically. I don't know if you had a chance to go hear the CalArts uh, faculty concert. They're really great musicians and uh, I was actually trying to go and play the last tune with them and uh, you know there was an argument going on between a critic and a musician and I couldn't get out. So. <laughs> but um, I really like to talk about the spirituality that's involved in improvisation because it's not talked about very much. The things that are talked about in jazz studies programs are, are usually technical, and that's good. But I think the other is also needed to really find out what makes someone have a desire to express themselves in, in music and in, in this art form called jazz. A lot of it comes from being inspired, inspiration, being inspired to create. And <clears throat> When I was a kid, my parents uh, were on the Grand Ole Opry, and as I was growing up, I was added to the band. And I sang on the radio since I was two until I was 15 every day, and which was a very lucky experience for me because I was exposed to great musicians like Hank Williams and, Oz and uh, Roy Acuff and the Carter family and Mother Maybelle Carter and, and uh, Chet Atkins and great country musicians that really played from their hearts and there was a lot of improvisation happening too. And most jazz musicians that I know are from large cities, uh, urban areas like New York and Chicago and Detroit, which is good too, but I was really lucky, I feel, to be brought up in the rural area of the states and in the Ozarks. <coughs> and to be exposed to music in a way where beauty was really important. And to think about what makes something beautiful and how do you make something beautiful and how do you discover how to, how to express it in a way that touches somebody else's life in, in a positive way that, that allows them to touch something deeper inside themselves that has a po positive effect on another human being. So I just started out talking in this class from the beginning about all different kinds of things in life and playing all kinds of different music that I thought was important for everybody to hear, different solos, different improvisations. One day I brought, I would bring in 42 different versions of Body and Soul by different musicians improvising on this song, which is, I think is one of the most perfect melodies one of the most perfect compositions that was ever composed. It took four guys to write it. And um, John Green was the guy that contributed the music to it. And, and so we have a dialogue that's created in the classroom. I don't like to call it a classroom, and I don't like to call myself a teacher, and I don't like to call the people in the classroom students. I think we're all together, and I think we're discussing. I would like to think that we can discuss uh, what makes an impact on an art form meaningful. And um, so that's quite a, a task to go about thinking about ways of making this happen and making this dialogue uh, mean something. And uh, lo and behold, I had a lot of students who were interested, so much so that uh, everybody started talking and and contributing their own ideas about their insecurities when they're playing, which everybody has. You know. And one of the things that I really started uh, trying to convey to everyone was that 
music taught me so much about life. Um, when I began to experience improvising, I started learning so much about life that music taught me in the moment of improvisation. When, you, when one improvises, you're in the moment that's happening at that time. There's no yesterday, there's no tomorrow, there's just right now. And in that moment, you see life in a completely different way. And you see yourself in a completely different way. I saw myself, the insignificance of me, before I saw the significance. I saw the unimportance of me before I saw the importance. It teaches, it taught me true humility and the importance of striving to be a good human being before you do anything. And maybe if you strive to become a good person, you might have a chance on becoming a great jazz musician. Because that's really the first step, is to develop your qualities of givingness, of humility, of appreciation. Every great musician that has made an impact on this art form is a musician with humility that when they take their, their instrument, they say, thank you for the gift that I've been given, and now I want to give it back to, to everybody. And um, talking about being inspired, what inspires you, talking about surrounding your life with art, talking about finding out about the great painters, the painters that really move you, reading about their lives, what motivated them to want to paint. There was a, just a, well I think the showing is still at the Whitney in New York of a, of a painter, African American painter named Bob Thompson who died in the 60s. We were very close friends and he, he used to come to the Five Spot every night to hear us play in 1959. And um, I don't think there was a night that he wasn't there and we were there for four months. And uh, he used to take me with him back to his loft. And they didn't even say the word loft. It was, he had this big space down in the Lower East Side. Uh, this was before Soho, before lofts. This was like a big room where he had all of his canvases and easels and, and Bob painted there. And uh, I used to hang out with him every day. And we talked about everything, about what motivated him to paint. And then he used to ask me all kinds of questions about music and what motivated me to create music and to play. And what did I think about when I was playing? And I used to ask him, what do you think about when you're painting? And he would say, I'm really not thinking. I'm creating. And I said, well, that's what I'm doing. Because when you're really involved in playing music, the thought process is not happening. It's uh, a process of all the senses going into one channel, which is listening and hearing and trying to find the, your music inside you. And once you start to think, um, the music stops. The thought process causes the creative process to stop. I tell all my students, try not to think about what you're doing. Try not to even uh, be concerned about anything that's going to make you take you away from the music. And Bob called me one day and he said, Charlie, he said, come down here quick. And I said, what's happening? He said, I'm putting you on a painting. So I got in the cab and I went down to his, his loft and um, he was painting this, this uh, beautiful uh, picture called The Garden of Music. It's on display in, at the Whitney now. And it's about 15 feet high as well as wide. He, he was painting on a ladder. And uh, he painted like forests, very primitive. And uh, 
pastoral scenes. And um, in this particular painting, in this garden, were Ornette Coleman and Don Cherry and Ed Blackwell and uh, Sonny Rollins and um, I'm trying to think of another musician, John Coltrane. And, and I was like out there in the pasture with my bass over my head. And um, he used to call me, he called me one day and he said, hey man, he said, you're here a lot. And he said, I feel better when you're here. Could you come back down here? I need you here when I'm painting, just, you know, because I'm used to, you know, hanging out with you. And I started thinking a lot about the creative process and what that means in every art form. And I think that in every art form, everyone that dedicates themselves to an art form must feel a responsibility to communicate beauty as much as they can to as many people as they can to make the world a better place. And I think that every artist, whether it's in jazz or painting or filmmaking or composing or dance, has a responsibility to do this, to bring people to beauty, to bring beauty to people, to touch someone's life in a way that allows them to touch something inside themselves that they've never, they've never touched. You know, like, uh, I think that everyone is born on this planet an artist. I think that everybody is born with creative sensitivity. And I think that the society we live in, in one way or another, starts to stifle that as we grow up. And I think that the mass media, especially in these times that we live in, have started to dictate to people what's important in their lives and then proceed to sell them those things. And it's up to the artist to turn that value system around because we're bombarded every day and conditioned to a system of profit-oriented shallow values as opposed to the values that an artist feels, which are creative values. And um, every day when I wake up, I think about how lucky I am to be alive and how precious this life is and how important it is to give to somebody in that day and to not to think about myself so much. I've always thought that to be a great musician, <clears throat> you have to be able to rise above everything and forget about <coughs> yourself. And uh, I think what the class is really about is living your life in the everyday sense on the level that you live your life when you're performing and you're playing. Because when one is creating, you're at a level beyond category. You're at a level that's beyond really um, paying your rent and going to the supermarket and responsibilities that you have in your everyday life. And I think it's so important to be able to the hard part, you know, I tell everybody, I'm great, I'm okay as long as I have my bass in my hands. When I put my bass down, I'm in trouble. Because that means I have to rise to the level in the other parts of my life that I'm at when I'm playing. And that's a real difficult task. Because when you really see yourself, your insignificance before you see your significance, that means that's the true ego, because only after you see your insignificance can you see your importance and your significance. And we're so lucky as musicians and people in the art forms 
to be able to learn that from our art form because not many people uh, have a chance to learn about life in that way. Um, is everyone here a musician? Raise your hand. Man. That is fantastic. Um, and how many uh, here play music as a way, as a means of uh, support to live? Fantastic. One of the other things I tell the students in my class is that even if you don't go on to become a musician, a professional musician when you leave here, if you learn about improvisation and about creative creativity and music, it's going to enhance whatever you do when you leave, no matter whether you become um, a lawyer or a doctor or whatever it might be. One student asked me one day, Mr. Hayden, and I said, don't call me, just call me Charlie. I said, Charlie, uh, why do you close your eyes when you play? Well, of course, the obvious answer to that is to concentrate. Because when you're in the process <coughs> of creating a melody and creating a chord structure, you really have to, to have the ability to block everything else out of your mind and just to concentrate on the music and listening. But I told this story the night that I opened at the Five Spot in 1959, November, with Ornette, Don, and Billy. Um, Ornette was taking out his horn, and Don was taking out his trumpet, and, and Billy was setting up his drums and his cymbals, and I had just taken the cover off my bass, and it was our first night to play there. I, you know, I was nervous. I was 21, 22 years old, and, and uh, we had just come to New York uh, before that on this World Airways plane that made stops in about five cities and had, when we had turbulence, almost fell apart. And anyway, um, so I told the story that uh, when I looked out in the audience, the, the bar was facing the bandstand, and standing along the bar in a line, were Percy Heath, Paul Chambers, Charlie Mingus, <laughs> Ray Ray, um, Henry Grimes. I mean, uh, every great bass player in New York was there, <laughs> looking right at me. <laughs> and I said, from that moment on, I closed my eyes. <laughs> But um, I've been very fortunate in my career to play with many great musicians. I, I try and seek out many different musicians, and I really try to not recognize inside myself about categories, because I think that great musicians play beyond category, and uh, sometimes the, the category of jazz can make people very insecure if they're not exposed to it very much. <coughs> And they think uh, they get, uh, you know, I have to concentrate, I have to think, I have to, you know, completely change the way I am in order to appreciate this music. And, and uh, I try to think of ways to make it easier for someone to see that they have the capabilities and they have the awareness and the sensitivity to really appreciate beautiful music. And after every concert that I have, either with my quartet or whoever it is I'm playing with, I, I usually go up to the microphone and I congratulate everybody in the audience and tell them that they're very, very great people, that they have great ears. Because in order to appreciate this art form, you have to have a really good ear and that they should applaud themselves. And they really like that. And, and I believe that very sincerely. Um, I think it's important for everyone to start to think about the discovery of you. 
because that's what this music is. This music is not learning a minor seventh uh, chord or a minor scale or being the baddest tenor player or being the baddest trumpet player or being the baddest drummer. This music is about discovering you as if you did not play any particular instrument. Some of my bass students, I tell them, try to play the music that you're hearing. Sit down and play it on the piano. Don't, don't call yourself a bass player, because that can limit you. That can actually create a mindset, the same way that playing a solo can create a mindset. Oh, now I'm going to play a solo. I've got it. And they all, everybody tenses up, and, and um, they, they prevent themselves from really opening up to the possibilities of discovering their own music. And it's really important that you see music on a wider scale than that, with more vision and more spirituality. I try to bring many, many great things to play, like I said before, that people can hear. I'm talking about Ravel, Rachmaninoff, Bach. I'm talking about Robert Wilkins, the blues singer. I'm talking about country music. Um, every kind of ethnic music, every different kind of music from different parts of the world, uh, or different categories, I try to bring and play and uh, expose them to music that really moves them and inspires them. What causes some music to inspire people and it doesn't inspire other people? What, that's one of the things we were discussing in this panel, too. You know, some of the critics were saying, some critics, uh, you know what they're going to write if they're listening to a traditional jazz group because they're more conservative in their views. And some critics are more uh, closer to newer contemporary music, and when they hear that kind of music, they're going to write more favorably about that. And if they hear something traditional, they're going to put it down. But the important thing is to discover what you feel and what you hear. And there are so many different ways to go about this. And um, one of them is sound. Did you ever think of a saxophone and a trumpet and all the metal instruments? They're just machines. And everybody who takes them up and starts to play them makes them sound different. And that's the beauty about this music, is that Sonny Rollins can take somebody else's saxophone that's not his and sound just like him, the way he's hearing. And to think about discovering the way you hear, and discovering your sound. I'm not talking about a style. Style is a, a, something that um, gets uh, misunderstood a lot by people. Someone came up to me one day and said, what's originality? And I said, you. You are originality. And, um, if you really look back on, on the history of art in the world, you'll see different times when there was innovation and, and times when there wasn't in every art form. And the most important thing is to make innovation happen. Start to play your instruments as if you've never heard music before in your life and you're playing for the first time. You're creating something new that's never been created before. Start to try and play the sunset, or a beautiful range of mountains, or a rainforest, or a little baby that you see being wheeled by its mother. You know, it's like trying to think about everything that comes from the same place that we do on this planet. And it's such a beautiful thing to think about, being here and being able to create something that's going to allow you to discover your music 
and give it back to the world. I, uh, I've met many great musicians and got to play with many great musicians and ask them all questions about how they feel about life, and I've learned a lot about life just in that respect. And um, there are some musicians that I never had a chance to play with that I wish I could have played with. I wish I could have played with Bart Powell. To me, he was one of the great musicians. I wish I could have played with Charlie Parker. One time I had a chance to play with Monk. I was on a tour in 1971 with Ornette and Dewey Redman and Ed Blackwell, and we were on this tour called the uh, Newport Jazz Festival Tour of Europe in 1971, and we toured 19 different countries. I didn't hear, well, Thelonious was with this band called the Giants of Jazz, which was Thelonious, Art Blakey, Al McKibben, um, uh, Sonny Stitt, and we, and then Duke Ellington's band was on the tour, I was with Ornette, there were, and Dexter Gordon was on the tour, and, and Miles Davis's band with Keith Jarrett was on the tour. That's when we got to start hanging out with Keith and we started our trio. But, um, we were in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, when, when it was, you know, a country, and everybody was living in harmony together, and um, we were playing at the United States Embassy in Belgrade, and we were playing, uh, actually we were at a party, and this was after the concert, and, and uh, Nellie, Thelonious Monk's wife, was with him, and um, she was carrying with her a carrot juicer. She made carrot juice for him every day. She would go to the market wherever we were and she would buy carrots and make carrot juice for, for Monk. And, and I didn't hear him say one word the whole tour. Not one word did he say, unless it was, I saw him and Nellie having a conversation, you know, quietly on the plane or in the hotel lobby or wherever. And at this party, they asked Monk to play. And Nellie came running up to me and she said, Monk wants you to play bass with him. I said, man. I ran to the front of the building. I got a taxi. I went to my hotel ran up the stairs, got my bass, and came down the elevator, went back to the taxi, you know, told him to go fast, back to the embassy. You know, the, the taxi screeched to a halt in front of the embassy, and I'm running with my bass through the front door, and I walk in, and Monk's playing with a Yugoslav bass player. Aww. But, um, Someone, someone told me the story about Monk and Bud Powell. They were being interviewed. Actually, they hadn't seen each other in 10 years, and they were doing a reunion kind of a concert tour together in, in, uh, in Europe, and they were in Paris. And they were with their wives, Nellie, and Bud Powell had Buttercup with them. And uh, this French journalist from Jazz Magazine was interviewing them, going to interview both of them. And they were taking a train to the city, like, I don't know, three hours away. And during the trip, the journalist was going to interview them. So they were in first class, of course, on the, on the train, and the train started out. And I, like I said before, they hadn't seen each other in 10 years, and they were boyhood friends, you know. And uh, so Monk was, they were, Monk and Nellie were on one side of the compartment, and, and, and Bud and uh, Buttercup were on the other side, and the journalist was sitting with, with, uh, next to, to uh, Bud Powell. And uh, so one hour went by, and Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk were just staring at each other. Right? <laughs> Nobody said anything. Two hours went by. Monk and Bud were like. So, 
the journalist started to get a little bit fidgety. <laughs> he went out and he, he was smoking. Three hours went by. Bud and Mark were like, <coughs> finally he couldn't contain himself anymore. He said, Mrs. Powell, is there something wrong with Bud? Is there something wrong with Monk? And, and Buttercup said, Bud is so happy to see Monk. <laughs> and Nellie said, and Monk is so happy to see Bud. <laughs> so, um, there are also, you know, so there's so many interesting stories. I wish I had, you know, hours to tell you everything. I'm just so uh, happy that everybody's here. Um, and uh, I just talked to, I have triplet daughters and son, and they're all playing music and recording, and I'm so proud of them. And uh, I just feel lucky to be here and, and to share all my experiences, or some of them with you. And if any of you have any questions, be glad to answer anything you want. Where do you draw the line between um, profoundly touching a few people and superficially touching a lot of people? Which is more important and why? Yeah. Um, I Yeah. Say it once more. Um, is there a microphone we can pick up? Can we all know? I don't no? think so. I was wondering what um, you thought, uh, like where you would draw the line between deeply touching a few people in the audience or um, superficially touching a lot of people in the audience by being really accessible, What, which you felt like was more important and why and whether you can go too far in either direction. Well, um. I can't imagine wanting to superficially touch anyone. I play and I try to make the music sound as great as I can make it sound so that I'm going to touch somebody in a positive way. And, um, you know, one time I was playing with Quartet West in Boston and I think my wife Ruth was with us. We were traveling and, and um, after the concert, everybody was coming up to ask me to sign CDs and different things. And all of a sudden, there was this kid with a tux on, and this woman with him with a white gown, and they had rice all over him. <laughs> and, I, and I was trying to figure, is that dandruff, or what is what's going on? You know? they, and, she, and the guy said, Mr. Hayden, we just got married four hours before we came here, and you inspired us to get married. Now, now that was like one of the best things anybody could have ever said to me, because it's all about romance. <laughs> Did you ever listen to Rachmaninoff? There you go. I love adagios. I never could figure out why composers compose fast movements. <laughs> I think maybe they just do it because they think they have to. Because what they really want to do is the adagio. And because there's a formula already, you know, been centuries ago, they got to follow that formula. You know. But there's nothing more beautiful than this, the, the slow movement of Shostakovich's Fifth Symphony, or the slow movement of Ravel's Piano Concerto in G, or Rachmaninoff's uh, vocal leads, or just think of all the beautiful slow movements. Man. Last night, uh, Ruth and I went to hear uh, Renee Fleming, singer, at uh, Dorothy Chandler. And she really sings great, and she sang some of Strauss's songs. Really, really beautiful. One of them is called Morgan. 
which was sung at our wedding, Cathedral St. John the Divine in 1989, New Year's Eve. And I was playing at the Vanguard with my Liberation Music Orchestra. And uh, Henry Butler, whether you know it or not, is a great singer. And he sang Morgan at our wedding. And Paul Howley, the organist at Cathedral St. John the Divine, played it with him. It was so beautiful that I cried. And, uh, you know, after the wedding, we all went down to Vanguard. Lorraine Gordon proceeded to throw everybody out. But um, someone asked me once, um, how can you play a political song with the Liberation Music Orchestra and then play Body and Soul? And I answer that it doesn't matter whether a song is written for political reasons. It, what matters is the beauty. And a lot of the songs that I play with my Liberation Music Orchestra are very, very, most all of the songs are very, very beautiful songs because they were written from a people struggling to live in a free society. And they usually come from old folk songs and they change the words, but the, the beautiful melody and beautiful chords. So really I, I believe that this art form that we're all involved in is really a political art form because it's, it's about an art form struggling to gain respect and to be heard and to be recognized. I really believe that this music should be presented in the greatest concert halls in the world, with the greatest acoustics in the world, the greatest sound systems in the world, no smoking, no drinking, just the way classical music. I mean, can you imagine Pavarotti singing at the Vanguard? <laughs> Not that I don't like the Vanguard. I mean, you've got to have a jazz club once in a while. I understand that, but I really want, I think it's so important to elevate the music to a level where people think about this music in a way that there's respect. Um, one of the things I wanted to say at the panel was, uh, when the critics were talking, was <clears throat> Van Gogh only sold one painting before he died. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> So, um, <coughs> if everybody here is really devoted, to, oh, yes. I was just curious how you resolve what might seem to be two opposing directions, <coughs> deeply spiritual and personal, and what is political and maybe even revolutionary. Well, you know, The revolutionary music to me is very spiritual. <laughs> and if you recognize the spirituality in the music, then you're going to play it with a, in, a, in a spiritual way. But I think every honest musician and dedicated musician plays music and approaches music in a spiritual way, whether they realize it or not. Um, yes? Fresh Air, right? Yeah. Terry Gross. <laughs> she caused that to happen. <laughs> you know, I sang every day on the radio since I was two until I was 15. And when I was 15, I had vulvar polio. During the polio epidemic in the Midwest, all the hospitals were filled. They didn't have a vaccine. <coughs> and the doctor told me that I was very lucky that it, instead of hitting the legs or the lungs, it hit my the left side of my face and my throat and my vocal cords. I couldn't talk. So for about a year, I was recuperating from that. He said that the reason I was lucky is because I would eventually regain all everything back, you know, whereas if it had hit my legs or lungs, I wouldn't have. It. And, um, but one of the things was it really stopped the range that I had to sing. And, um, 
I don't even sing in the shower. <laughs> but um, sometimes, when I, you know, when you when you live in Los Angeles, you spend most of your life in a car. <laughs> so sometimes I improvise in the car. You know. And I think it's very important bringing that subject up for everybody in here. Whenever you improvise, you should be able to sing the harmony notes of every melody note that you play. It's really, really important to sing all the harmony notes by ear. My dad and mother taught me, you know, well, actually, my mother said she was rocking me to sleep when I was a baby, and she used to hum all these songs to me when she was rocking me to sleep. And, you know, my brothers and sisters would be passing through the room, and they'd be humming harmony with her. <laughs> and pretty soon, one day, before I was two, she said I started humming harmony with her. And that's how I learned, by doing it every day, learning how to sing all the harmony parts by ear. Really, really, really important. So, you know, Terry had me on her show about my album called Now is the Hour with Quartet Western Strings. And we talked about the song Now is the Hour, and I told her that when I was a kid during World War II, I used to hear Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby on the radio singing the song Now is the Hour, and I used to cry. It was so beautiful. And um, so she said, would you sing it? And I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so I sang it. And um, she said, oh, that was so great. Anyway, the show ended. And uh, before I left the NPR studios in LA, uh, the phone rang. And it was Terry. She said, Charlie, that was one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. You've got to sing on your next record. <laughs> and I said, well, thanks, Terry, but no, I, I don't think I want to get into that. <laughs> but uh, my wife, Ruth's a great singer. My kids are all great singers. But I sing what I try to sing. I try to play as if I were singing. You know? um, maybe someday I might. I don't know. Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, how do you approach practicing? Um, I know when I like when I, I was, uh, how do you? She's, she's asking me how do we how do I approach practicing? When because a lot of times when I'm practicing, I mean it's very difficult to approach it in like the technical aspect of it because I'm always I'm always more for myself anyway. I'm more in tune to the more just like feeling of the music and stuff. Um, how, do you, how do you approach that? One of the greatest things that I've ever heard Paul Blay say, you know Paul Blay, the pianist? Uh, we were playing at the Iridium, uh, or we were somewhere, and, and I heard him talking to a couple of his students who came to hear him play. And he says, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is don't ever practice. <laughs> and the reason he says that is to what he believes, to keep your spontaneity completely pure. But I think that one can approach practicing in a way where you're playing instead of practicing. Sometimes if I'm on a concert and I'm playing, and I'm playing a solo, and, uh, and there's something that I can't quite make, which is like a lot, I'll remember that. And I'll go home and I'll take out the bass and I'll go over what I couldn't do and I'll try to do it. But mostly I just play. Like sometimes uh, I accompany Ruth when she sings at home and then other times I'll put on uh, one of my favorites. See, Scotty LaFaro was one of my closest friends. He was the bass player with Bill Evans back in 1960 and 59. And we became like brothers. We were so close. And when he died, it almost killed me. But um, um, he, uh, he was in this trio with Bill Evans and Paul Lotion, who was also a very close friend of mine. We played together with Keith a lot. And, and um, I put on their album at Sunday at the Village Vanguard, and I play with it. It's real inspiring to me, because we were very close. And, actually never thought that Scotty liked the way I played because he never told me. 
I was always telling him, because he shared my apartment with me in L.A. before we both went to New York. I, I went to New York with Arden, and he went, he came running in the apartment one night and with his LP. They didn't have CDs then, and he came in with the LP, and he said, man, you got to hear this piano player. And it was Bill Evans' first trio record. He said, someday I'm going to play with this guy. <laughs> and uh, one night, I was with Paul Motion, and we, we were on tour with Keith Jarrett, and we were talking about Scott, and I said, you know, Scotty, I don't think, because everybody was trying to play like Scotty, and I was just trying to play like, I was just trying to play, period, you know. And uh, I wasn't thinking about um, being influenced by anyone. I just wanted to get out the music I was hearing. And I told Paul, I said, you know, I always used to tell Scotty what a genius he was. And he was. I mean, the guy played so beautifully. He was one of the only musicians I ever knew who could combine creativeness and technical abilities in a perfect way. He merged the two of them together, and he used to practice all day. He would take Sonny Rollins solos from the records and copy them down on the bass clef, and he would play them over and over again, man. Over and over again. And I would come home, and he would be like, real depressed. I'd say, Scott, what's wrong? He'd say, oh man, I'll never be able to play. I'd say, you've got to be kidding me. You play better than anybody I've ever heard. And I told Paul, I said, you know, he never told me if he liked my playing. He said, well, that's ridiculous, man. He said, one night we were at the Vanguard with Bill, and you were across town on the east side of the five spot with Ornette, and there was a snowstorm outside. And Scotty, there was an intermission, and Scotty put on his coat, and I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going over the, to the five spot to hear this fantastic bass player with Arnett Coleman, man. You've got to come with me. I said, did he really say that? <laughs> Not me. No, I think practicing is great. I think that you should approach practicing in a way of playing instead of practicing. Play things at home that you really like to play. And play things that attract you musically that you can't play and learn how to play them. But always be inspired. Really look for inspiration. Look for beauty. Because if you start to play exercises that you feel that you have to play in order to improve your technique, you're just going to get bored and you're going to get upset and you're going to stop. And, and um, we're in this, 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 uh, this form of music that's about improvising. If you were a classical player, then that's a completely different story. An interpretive musician interprets other people's music, and they've got to really... I, I, used to, I took about five lessons with this guy, Herman Reinsagen, who was the first bassist under Toscanini in New York, and he lived in L.A. I think Mingus studied with him a little bit, and Ray Brown studied with him a little bit. And I went to my first lesson with him. I was scared to death, you know. And he was like in his 80s, and he had a beautiful bass in every corner. It was such a beautiful music room. And uh, I used to walk in this music room and get inspired immediately. And, and so he had this beautiful uh, old antique music stand, and he had his music, and he said, he said, play for me. So I started playing the blues. And when I finished, he says, that's what I want. He says, every day, Every lesson, you come and play for me, and I'll play for you. And that's how we did it. And one day he wrote out, um, he wrote out uh, exercises for me, classical exercises for me, just for me, in his own hand, and I still have them to this day. They're really great. But, uh, you know, I should practice more. That's definite. <laughs> that's definite. Do you sing while you play? No. That to me, that's a waste of energy because two things are going on at once. Even if it's unconscious, you don't really realize it's utilizing some more of your energy that you could be putting into the music. Uh, do you sing when you improvise, when you play? Okay, guys and <laughs> women. <laughs> Thank you.
The Certificate of Appreciation, the 26th Annual IAJE International Conference, Anaheim, California, to Charlie Hayden for outstanding service to jazz education. Please join me in thanking Charlie Hayden.